Hello, everybody, <clears throat> and welcome to um, this uh, Lovecraft Mythos, Cthulhu Mythos. God, I forgot what I've even called these things. Um, Cthulhu Mythos video deals. Now, um, the story, the story we're going to read today, um, there are going to be heavy spoilers. So if you have not read The Thing on the Doorstep, um, go over to, I mean, you could just Google search The Thing on the Doorstep and um, you'll be able to read it, like put read online or something like that. You could go to um, hplovecraft.com. Um, you can find it there um, if you don't have it. But there is no real way to talk about this story without, um, I guess, talking about the twist. <clears throat> um, and when I say talking about the twist, this isn't like, oh, you ruined the fact that there's a twist. Like, there, um, it's very obvious what the twist is. Like, you'll have a good idea about it in the first third of the story by the second bit of the story um you know exactly what's going to happen and you're just waiting for the shoe to drop kind of thing um i guess we'll do like a little overview of the story and then get into the brass tacks of it so um the thing on the doorstep it's it's a weird story for lovecraft for um a few different reasons one um, it's really the only Lovecraft story that has a, I don't know if you call it a strong female lead, and we'll get into why that is later. Or not lead, but like a strong female at all in the story. Um, it's also one of the only Lovecraft stories where the protagonist of the story is kind of using his own will to do things because there's a lot of Lovecraft stories where things just kind of happen to the characters. The um, cosmic horror of everything um, just happens and the protagonist is usually just an observer of this and then they probably end up going mad. The other thing that makes the story kind of weird um, and it's not completely out of Lovecraft's element, but you have a story where um, the narrator is kind of the, at least for us, the biggest part of the story, because without the narrator, we wouldn't know anything that's going on. But um, the narrator does absolutely nothing as a character until the very end. But the way this story starts... Um, gives you this hope that, oh, our narrator is going to kick into action in a bit here. We just have to wait for it. And in going over all these Lovecraft stories, it um, makes me wonder a little bit about Lovecraft as a person in the sense that he was so detached from society. He was so detached from um, I guess real life is the best way to put that to the point where all of his um, interactions with the outside world for the most part happened through letters. And so that being what it is, it would make sense that his stories are kind of told like secondhand. Um, you could go to Call of Cthulhu like this um, at the Mountains of Madness like this. Um, the Whisper in the Dark, like this. Like, so many of his stories are about being told information from somebody else. And then the narrator trying to figure out what to do with that information. And usually, the narrator does nothing with this information. To an extent. Um, and then maybe at the end, the narrator will do something. Um, 
But it, it always cracks me up when I'm reading Lovecraft at how long it takes for the narrator to be like, huh, maybe something should be done. It's it's always this, like, as a reader, you're going, <clears throat> come on, man, do something. And um, the narrator is usually just too fucking proper to do anything like that. So anyway. Um, I said I was going to do a summary of this before we got into it, and I just started talking about other shit. So we basically have a few characters here. Um, our narrator is um, Daniel Upton, and um, he's recounting this tale about his friend Darby, um, last name Darby. I'm going to refer to them as Darby and Upton, or else I'm going to get really confused here. Now, the way the story starts out is a fucking bang because he's like, um, I just want you to know that, like, yes, I did um, shoot my best friend in the face and um, killed him. But um, I, I need you to understand that this wasn't who you think it was and all this other shit. Um, so it's like that's a good ass fucking hook it just grabs you and you're like oh shit this motherfucker just shot his best friend that's fucking crazy tell me more um so it goes into excruciating detail about and it's so funny how lovecraft could take a short story and go into excruciating detail about anything but he seems to do it all the fucking time and then when it comes to, like, getting into real detail about certain shit, no, nope, we're not going to do that. I gave you excruciating detail about a bunch of other stuff earlier in the book. Um, so we have that again, and we learn all about um, Darby's upbringing. And like most people who live in the Arkham area, um, he is, they're, they're, they both go to Missicatonic um, university and um, they're both into the occult and in reading um, books like the Necronomicon and the book of Ibon and um, what is it nameless cults so they bond over this and shit um, and then Darby meets this woman named Azanath who um, is also into the occult and they bond over their occult learnings. This is where I'm going to divert from the summary here for a minute to talk about this one bit. Azanath is this female character in a Lovecraft story, which is weird, first off. Um, but a lot of um, people feel that this story makes, um, it shows Lovecraft's misogyny. And um, I'm not going to say that he was not a misogynist, but the point that a lot of people make as to what would make what Lovecraft wrote misogynistic in this, I think is taken out of context. So there's a bit where um, he says that um, Azanath like reeks of fish. Okay. And that's the line that a lot of people have a beef with. And some of you are going, damn, calm down, Howard, like bring it back a notch. But, um, if you know anything about Lovecraft's work, and especially this story, because this story talks about so much other shit, that you almost have to know his other work in order to make any assessment on this. Now, the reason why Azanath reeks of fish is because she is Innsmouth folk. And if you know anything about the town of Innsmouth in Kingsport, you know about... Um, the hybrid humans that have mated with the Deep Ones. The Deep Ones are these otherworldly kind of fish god people um, that started 
breeding with humans in Innsmouth for some nefarious purpose, okay? So if you know anything about Innsmouth, you would know um, the fact that he said this had nothing to do um, with him being like shitty about women, but has everything to do to hint to the reader if you've read any of his other work, oh shit, this chick is one of those people. You know, like that's that's the bread and butter of it. <clears throat> now, um, we're going to get to a part in a little bit here where I think um, if you wanted to say he had misogynist thoughts or whatever, um, it would be, it should be more pointed towards this other thing that we'll get to. So anyway, um, Darby ends up marrying Azanath. And it turns out that Azanath's father was this dude named Ephraim Wait, And Ephraim was um, basically a devout occultist. And as we get further into the story, not only was he an occultist, but this motherfucker was like a wizard. Okay? A fucking wizard. So that's some pretty hardcore shit. And um, as an ass mother, who no one ever saw her face, was always veiled um, because she was probably um, a deep one. or Yeah, deep one, old one, deep one. Um, so whatever. <clears throat> um, and then like there were girls at school who said Azanath would like be looking at him and then suddenly they would feel themselves inside Azanath's body looking out of Azanath's eyes at them sitting there looking at Azanath. Okay, so if that's not a fucking, like, big fucking red flag as to what's going to happen in this story, I don't know what else would be. So, as the years go by, um, Darby is acting peculiar. Sometimes he's fine, sometimes he's not. One of the greatest devices in this story is when Darby comes to visit Upton. Um, he has a particular knock, you know, like... Um, shave and a haircut you know it's not like that it's three knocks and then two knocks so whenever upton hears the three knocks and two knocks he knows it's darby <clears throat> well one day um i'm, I'm kind of going all over the place here but one day um there's a normal knock at the door and he answers it and it's dark and it's upton or no it's darby and he's like oh i i didn't know that was going to be you and um, so, long story short, Darby starts acting different, and then acting normal, and then acting different, and then acting normal, like on different days and shit. And finally, Darby's like, okay, I need to tell you something. Long story short, as we know that's happening, um, Azanath is going into... Um, Darby's body and leaving um, Darby trapped inside Azanath's body and uses Darby's body to go do other shit. Well, then it turns out that Azanath isn't even Azanath and that Azanath is really Ephraim. So the one woman in any Lovecraft story was never a woman in the story in the first place. When Ephraim was dying, he um, put his soul into his daughter's body and put his daughter's soul into his dying body. Okay? So that's pretty fucked right off the bat. Um, but then Darby comes to um, Upton and says, you know what? Me and Azanath had it out. She's gone. Um, she went back to her people or whatever. But um, she promised that she would leave me alone and everything's okay now. So I think everything's going to be fine. All this other shit. Well, some months go by and then it turns out that everything's not fine. And um, what we find out 
in a horrific way. Um, there's a knock at the door and um, it's three and two. So Upton goes and answers it and there's this horrible smell, horrible smell. And there's this short squat thing in an overcoat and a hat and a muff, um, a muffler or whatever there. And it's like gurgle, gurgle, gurgle. And um, it hands um, Upton a note. And the note's like, hey, it's me, Darby. Um, I fucked up. Um, when I said Azanath left, that's not true. I killed her. I smashed her head in and buried her in the basement. And um, I thought that's all I had to do. And I thought she was dead. But um, it turns out that even though the body's dead, the spirit could still be in it. And um, Ephraim took my body and put my soul into um, Azanath's corpse that was buried in the basement. And it took me a while to dig my way out. But um, here I am. I don't know how much longer I could last like this. Um, but I need you to go to Ephraim and um, kill him and make sure you cremate the body because the soul still lives inside the body after the body's dead. And um, so that's where we leave the story. <clears throat> we leave the story with um, uh, Ephraim or Darby, who's been in an asylum now. Um, Upton goes and shoots and kills um, Darby or the fake Darby. So anyway, the story has a lot of meat to it, a lot of stuff. And um, the thing that trips me out probably more than anything about this story, even though a lot of stuff there is very trip outable, is that like a lot of... Lovecraft's t stories that ended up in weird tales and stuff like that. Um, he didn't submit this himself. And this happened a lot with him where he would write a story and then fucking hate it so much after he wrote it that he didn't want to have anything to do with it. So um, instead of sending it out for publication, um, he may send it to a friend of his just so they can see what he wrote and maybe understand why he didn't like it. And then the friend would then submit it to Weird Tales for him um, anyway. And it would usually get accepted, and he would usually make money on it. And the funny thing is, is that a lot of the times that this happened, it happened because Lovecraft felt the story was, like, too pulpy, like, too lowbrow. And, um, but a lot of times he would send in is what he thought was higher brow work and it wouldn't get accepted. And so it's this whole dichotomy of like, um, if you, and I mean, it hasn't changed. If you want your shit to sell, you need to sell cookie cutter shit. Um, unless there is some magical series of events that leads you to be able to put out a very unique work and have people behind it to market it and have an audience there to love it. And that happens all the time, but more often than not, the other happens. So that's one of those weird things. But yeah, I mean, um, going back to the misogynistic shit, I would say it's probably more misogynistic for Lovecraft to, um, finally write a female character and then have it turn out that um, she wasn't a female well she was a female in body you guys know what I'm saying so um, that's the shit with that um, another thing one of the reasons why he even wrote this story was because I believe I might be wrong about this I believe it was Robert E. Howard um basically urging him to just write a quick story in like a day about um, something fantastical, make it punchy, and just that's a pulp story. Write it and send it in. 
And he wrote it and didn't want to send it in, basically, because I think he felt like it would tarnish his name a little bit. Um, but he probably didn't mind the scratch he got from it once it did get accepted. So anyway, a lot of people find this work to be one of the poorest later stories that um, he wrote. And that actually kind of shocked me because... Um, I think the hook is great. It kind of meanders in the beginning, but like most Lovecraft stories meander in the beginning. And um, it had a really gruesome twist. You know, it's like, what more do you want? You know, and I mean, it hits the Necronomicon points. It talks about Azathoth and the Shugoths and all this other stuff. Um, there's like interdimensional shit that goes on that I didn't even talk about. Um, so there's all sorts of stuff that would like kind of make this almost like a greatest hits of, um, Lovecraft stuff. And like, even the names of the people like, um, uh, Pikmin Darby, um, like if you remember Pikmin's model, like there's a connection between those families, the Uptons have a connection to the people who paid for the, um, at the mountains of madness expedition. Um, like all of these things are connected. Like it's, it's a great web. Like he did a really good job. So why so many people kind of shit on this story? Um, I don't get, and I always have loved the image of this rotted corpse, like coming to him and not being able to talk and just kind of gurgle. Um, and I even, that inspired um, a scene in one of my um, Zombie Zero books. Um, so it's like, it's just a fucking cool little interesting thing. So anyway, um, again, down below, let me know what you think of this uh, story. If you liked it, if you didn't. Um, do you think this is one of his um, shittier um, late work things. So, um, take care and I'll see you guys later.